Penn State On Demand is a service of Penn State Public Broadcasting, and now you can support WPSU when you shop online. Visit WPSU.org slash shop to make purchases from national online retailers, and WPSU will receive a portion of the sale with no extra cost to you. So start your online shopping at WPSU.org slash shop. I do some consulting work on the American feeling in the room was You don't ever say to her that one of the shock wins. There's this great discussion on the ethical we left. Left. more of a community we're trying to back over. doing in autism. Alexander McCall Smith has charmed millions of readers worldwide with his life-affirming books, including his best-known series, The Number One Ladies Detective Agency. A widely respected expert on medical law and bioethics, McCall Smith has been honored with numerous awards for his writing, holds honorary doctorates from 10 universities, and was named Commander of the Order of the British Empire for his services to literature. We talked with him about his beloved Botswana, his career, and about the power of bush tea. Here's our conversation with Alexander McCall Smith. Alexander McCall Smith, welcome to the conversation. Thank you very much indeed. We are delighted that you made Penn State the 14th, your last stop on your latest U.S. book tour. And in fact, you'll uh, be talking at the Rock Ethics Institute. The talk is titled, How Are We to Live Our Lives? An Evening with Alexander McCall Smith. And part of your answer is, Live your life with attention to detail. What do you hmm. mean by that? Well, I think that it's, it's very important to, to, to look at the small things in, in life and to allow oneself time to contemplate uh, the day-to-day -day minutiae of one's life because that um, often is, is where one's life is actually happening. That if we sit around and, and wonder about the great big issues, uh, it's relatively rarely that we'll be called upon to make a decision about a great big issue, most of us. In fact, many of us don't have any great big issues at all. I, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's therefore useful to, to look at, uh, at the, the, the small details of one's, one's life and contemplate those. So things like um, uh, attention to friends, um, uh, attention to the detail of friendships that uh, one has, how we should treat our friends, what we could do for our friends, and so on. Uh, I think that's where uh, a great deal of, 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 of morality, so, so to speak, can be done. And that's exactly what Mara Matsui teaches us in, in your number one ladies' mm. detective series, which has been translated mm. at last count into 45 different languages, sold more mm. than 20 mm. million copies. Is that what you think makes her so endearing, so popular? Well, I think it's a little bit uh, difficult for an author himself to, to say exactly why uh, people are reading his, his books. Obviously, authors hope that that will happen. But to, to speculate on the, the reasons why a, a character uh, resonates with the readers can be a little bit difficult. But having said that, I would say yes, that I, I think that Mara Matsui is, is somebody who um, is very aware of, of, of other people. She's kind. There's a, there's a kindness, I think, is one of the main characteristics that we, we see in her. So I think she's the sort of uh, person uh, with whom people would like to sit down and have a cup of tea and have a talk and just mull over, over issues. And people like that because the modern world is is a is pretty frantic place, really. And the idea of being able to sit down and talk about uh, about the, the, the little things of life, I, I think is quite, quite useful. Before becoming a writer, you were a medical law professor and a respected expert mm -hmm. on bioethics. And in fact, you were teaching medical law at Edinburgh uh, University uh, when you submitted um, a children's book and an adult novel for a literary competition. The children's book actually won, and, and really that changed your life forever. Well, that's right, yes. Uh, uh, I think it's interesting that a lot of writers actually start by entering in some sort of competition, more than one would imagine. Uh, and I did that, and I very much hoped that the, uh, that the novel uh, itself, the, ma the, the main novel, would win, but it didn't. And the manuscript that I'd entered for, for, ch for children in the children's uh, category, children's novel category, was one of the winners, and so I was very pleased with that. Uh, and that set me off writing children's books. Uh, you wrote 30 of them. I did. I read quite, quite a lot of them, and I was asked to, to write more after the first one was, was published, and I'd never imagined 
uh, that I would actually be a writer of books for, for children. It, it hadn't been something that I'd planned in any way. In fact, really, so much of our lives are rather like that, actually, that uh, one, one ends up doing something by accident. And I, so I started being a, a writer of books for children by, by accident. And uh, I enjoyed that w well enough. Uh, but uh, in, in the mean, meantime, I, I, I had another career, so I was doing that in my spare time. And then, gradually, I, 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 I began to write uh, short stories for adults and, and uh, radio plays and things like that. And uh, then I sat down and wrote the number one ladies' detective agency, and, and that was the book that uh, changed really, your life. That really changed my, my that life. That was 1998. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the time, you agreed to write eight books in the series. You're now up to 13. That's right, yes, yes. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm about to start the, the, the 13th, so we've, we've got the 12th book published in that series. Yes, uh, I hadn't anticipated that uh, that, that would happen because uh, I originally wrote about Mara Matsui in a short story, a short, short story. And uh, I thought that, that would be, be it, but I rather liked the character, so I, I wrote uh, a full novel about her. And again, I thought that uh, that would be the end of that, that that, that would uh, be the extent of my literary conversation with her. And, uh, but, but you said to quit, it would be like walking out in the middle of a, of a, conver a conversation. I think that's right. Uh, so I agreed to do a sequel and then made it a trilogy and then a quartet and a quintet and, and so on. And now I feel that I, I want to continue um, having my annual conversation with Mara Matsui and her friends, um, I think for some time more. So there's still plenty to say about her. Uh, as long as the readers are happy to continue to read them, then I'm quite happy to continue to write them. You mentioned letters earlier, and you get fan mail mm -hmm. every day, which incidentally you answer. You answer every letter you get. I try to. Um, it, it can be quite difficult, and I suppose uh, particularly when I'm away, I have an assistant who, who will deal with, with these and, and explain that I'm away, and so people do get an answer. If they don't get one from me, they get one from the uh, assistant. But we get wonderful letters, and the letters are often very, very moving, actually. That's one of the things which I, I really uh, appreciate about this, this job, that uh, people write um, in a very moving way and may say that Mara Matsui uh, has helped them in some difficult uh, time of their life. People uh, wrote these at a, on their deathbed. Yes, yes, that's one of the, the in interesting things that I, I get letters from, from people who say that uh, they perhaps read the book with a, a dying parent um, or spouse and um, they, they will then write to me and, and, and say what, what, what it meant for them and, and that's, uh, that, that's a, a, a very moving thing for, for, for me and um, people also write to me and say that the uh, example of Mara Matsui, Mara Matsui as a character, as a friend for them, uh, has helped them in, in uh, uh, some sort of personal sorrow or difficulty. I, I get a lot of people saying that they, they read the books when they were, for example, having chemotherapy or something of that, that sort, and I'm always very touched um, uh, by that. It's, it's, it's very important for, for me. It seems to me that the, that the law professor and the writer are intimately intertwined. And I'm wondering, uh, where does the law professor end and the writer begin for you? Well, I've, I've more or less sort of ended the law professor. <laughs> you ended it, but in your stories, yes. people are writing wrongs and they're using oh, yes. their heads and their hearts and uh, yes. in solving yes, daily problems. I, I suppose that there is an influence. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, an, I'm often asked to identify what precisely the influence is, and I find that quite difficult. Um, I think other people might be rather better at identifying that than, than I. But uh, I suppose there are certain concerns that one would have if one's a law professor, you're very interested in human action in various contexts. Uh, and I was, certainly, when I was law professor, I was very interested in the, in the, in the status of human action, what people meant when they acted and what, the, what they meant when they spoke as well. And that's the sort of thing that lawyers actually are very interested in. And so that sits quite naturally, I think, with the business of being a novelist. Um, uh, I, th I think that it is com compatible. People often regard the law as being a little bit dry, but it, it, it isn't really. It's a, an intensely uh, human discipline, and there's something in the law for everybody, really. 
and one of the things about your characters is that there's a lot of forgiveness that if there if the intent mm -hmm. wasn't there to do a bad deed mm. the characters in your books forgive them well yes I'm, I'm very interested in forgiveness I think that forgiveness is, is something which uh, which we really need to try to keep uh, before us uh, because uh, at the moment uh, I think that many of our societies um, are somewhat retributive and, and actually want to point at the finger of blame at people. We're very interested in blaming people uh, for misfortunes. And if something goes wrong, th there's immediately uh, a cry uh, that the, the person who's caused the damage or caused the, uh, the wrong to come into existence should be identified and indeed punished. So the, there's a curious uh, retributive uh, feel to, to things which goes hand in hand, I think, with a, a sort of consumerism um, we're, we're regarded as customers of the world or clients of the world and that we're entitled to have um, everything satisfied and, and if it isn't satisfied then we blame people. And that I think actually rather demotes uh, forgiveness which is a central value. Um, and of course in the past um, uh, many societies uh, had uh, religious uh, systems which actually stressed forgiveness and indeed uh, this, this is still, uh, still the case but I suppose as the, the role of religion um, has been marginalized in, in, in the West or certainly not, um, uh, not, not ex exactly promoted. Uh, one wonders whether children are really receiving the sort of advice that you must forgive people. And I think in a way they, they probably aren't. And of course without forgiveness uh, it's very difficult for things to go forward because if we, if we don't forgive people who have wronged us then we clutter our lives uh, with all sorts of unfinished uh, business. I mean, take the the, the, the long-running um, historical um, issues uh, that pain the world. A lot of that is 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 to do with lack of of forgiveness and with keeping history alive uh, in 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 order to uh, to to make people um, antipathetic to one another. And it seems to me that in many ways you do more good in the world through your books than you probably could have done as a law professor. Well, that's very kind of you to say that. I don't know whether I, I do much good in the world, but I'd say that I'm, I'm talking to more people uh, today than I, than I did when I was a, a law professor. And though as a law professor, I was uh, wrestling with some of these issues, or certainly interested in some of these issues, and indeed writing about some of these issues. Uh, I think you're, you're right, and not, not many people paid any attention. Whereas uh, now, I suppose, I'm, I'm engaged in a, in a, in a conversation really with, with many millions of, of, of people and that's, I enjoy that and uh, uh, if I can make a point without being didactic or uh, without trying to preach to people, because I certainly don't want to preach to people, but if I can get Mara Matsui to make a point about forgiveness for example, she says she's a forgiving la lady, she doesn't want to punish people, she wants to forgive, the, forgive them. If I can get people to think about that then, uh, then that's fine by me. A lot of your books really are a conversation because mm. the, the, the books that started off as, as serial novels published first in, in the Scotsman uh, newspaper and, and in uh, the, uh, a newspaper in London or in the UK, um, they, you invited readers yes. to uh, provide input and they did and in fact many of their ideas ended up in your stories. Yes, I, I, I like that very much indeed. I very much enjoy writing these serial novels in the way in which 19th century writers, as you know, Charles uh, read them. Charles Dickens is, a, is an example, but a lot of the uh, writers of that, that time uh, regarded the serial uh, form of publication as being the normal form of publication. So uh, I like that and I, I do enjoy uh, people writing in with suggestions or, or, or telling me if I meet them at a reader's event. Um, that's great fun. And uh, if, if the ideas are all right, um, I would say, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I'll try and uh, put that into the plot. And people really are uh, often quite tickled by that. They think that's a very good idea. Now, sometimes I can't use their ideas if people write in um, perhaps in a rather vindictive way. They, if they don't like a character, they may say, let's punish so-and-so. Let's have something deeply unfortunate happen to that particular <laughs> character. One person suggested that one of my characters uh, should be run over by a steamroller. And I had to say that that really wasn't, wasn't something that I th felt that I could do. <laughs> of all of the characters that you've created, is there one <laughs> that speaks to you before you go to sleep, speaks to you when you wake up in the morning, and is most, in your mind, your alter ego? 
That's a very interesting question because uh, I've created uh, rather a lot of characters with, uh, with all these different series and so uh, I have um, a whole a string of people uh, from whom I could choose. Um, and you'd expect that I might perhaps even more have more than one character who stays with me all the time. I, I don't think there's one who's with me constantly. There's, there's one who uh, I think um, is often there and who uh, acts as a sort of advisor or indeed a censor or one might even say occasionally the spoiler of the fun <laughs> and that's Mara Motsui because if I feel that I'm going to say something uncharitable or do something uncharitable or something that uh, uh, really I shouldn't do Mara Motsui's voice comes to me and I think oh should I be doing that what would Mara Motsui say <laughs> so occasionally she just upbraids me for being too selfish or whatever the whatever the flaw or vice that I'm showing happens to be Mara Motsui is there on my shoulder but that, I suppose, happens if you create a character who's, who's really rather nice. She's going, to, she's going to advise you in that way. Well, speaking of Mara Matsui, the HBO uh, television series features in that role uh, a, a wonderful vocalist by the name of Jill Scott. And the producers of this series spent two years searching for her. Mm. Is she, in your mind, the person you had kind of envisioned? Well, there's a very interesting uh, aspect to that. I think uh, Jill Scott is a wonderful Mara Matsui and she did it beautifully and I, I really, uh, really liked her performance and I was uh, absolutely happy with it as uh, indeed I was uh, with the, the perform performance of the other uh, actors. Um, but the interesting thing is that I never see uh, the faces mm. of my characters, which is a rather unusual thing, and I suspect that most authors do see the faces of my characters, but I, I don't. So I actually really don't know what Mara Matsui looks like, other than that she's traditionally built, uh, which means she's quite a large lady, and that there's, there's a smile which appears a great deal. Uh, that was the only preconception I had about the physical appearance of Mara Matsui. So when I visited the film set, when they were making the initial Anthony Minghella movie uh, about it, the one that uh, kicked off the HBO series, um, I had this meeting with uh, Jill Scott, uh, and everybody was very excited about it, and there was great popping of flash bulbs and so on. And uh, people said, well, now, now is, that, is she what you is expected, that sort of thing. Uh, I said, well, of course, yes, it's absolutely <laughs> fine, uh, because I had no, I had no con con conception. Um, I think that the important thing was that the, 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 the smile and the sunny disposition um, had to be there. So she had to be somebody um, at whom one would look and say, that's a nice person. And I think one does that with uh, Jill Scott, and she, she did it really, really um, uh, beautifully. Uh, and of course, she's from, uh, she's from Philadelphia. That's uh, her, uh, her starting point, and uh, well done her. Because she hadn't been to Africa before. Uh, that she made those, those films and she mastered the accent and the body language absolutely beautifully. Really, really a tremendous performance. And of course this was all filmed in Botswana. Um, what is it about Botswana that so captivated you and so captivated everyone who's been involved in this project? I, I read that when the series was being filmed, you cried, the director mm. cried. Mm. Well, yes, uh, on that. Um, what actually reduced me to tears. I mean, there are many occasions in which authors will be reduced to tears by movies of their <laughs> books for the wrong reasons. Uh, my, my, my tears were, were tears of, of, of gratitude uh, and, and uh, very warm emotion. Uh, what had actually happened was that there was a very moving scene that uh, Antti Mengele had, uh, had filmed and uh, I visited him on the set one day and, and he said, I want to show you the um, advanced uh, version of, of this and he, he got his computer and turned it on and it was a, a wonderful scene in the film where um, a little boy who has been kidnapped um, is restored to his father, uh, a teacher, and the father looks across a bit of dusty ground and sees Mara Matsui's tiny white van come up and this little boy gets out and there's a moment of recognition on the father's part when he sees the boy and my goodness me it's it's moving so I, I just uh, I just burst out crying and uh, Minghella uh, patted me on the shoulder and said that he'd done exactly that <laughs> as well and then I, I learned that uh, at the funeral scene uh, the funeral of Obed Ramatsui, the late Obed Ramatsui, Mara Matsui's uh, father, that wonderful man, um, th the funeral scene Everybody on the set um, cried. The electricians cried. The cameramen cried. The the, the carpenters cried. The 
extras cried. Everything, everything was uh, a matter of, uh, of tears, and the Time journalist was there covering that. And he said that he started to cry, and after the 12th or 13th take, he could bear it no more and had to leave. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was all very positive, because it showed that it was a, uh, a film that was, that was genuine uh, and that was very moving. And of course, it, it was a film that was uh, filled with love. And one would say uh, the same about the series that, uh, that followed. Speaking of Mengele, he, he died not <laughs> long after making that film. That's right. It, it was uh, extremely tragic because it was the loss of, uh, of one of the, the, the greatest um, British uh, f film directors, an absolutely wonderful man. And uh, he died, alas, on the, the day of the showing, the premiere in, in London, which was, which was a very uh, cruel thing. And uh, yeah, he was a, a, a marvelous director. The English um, patient, yes. the, the talented uh, Mr. Oh, Ripley. Oh, the talented Mr. Ripley. I'm a great admirer of Patricia Highsmith. And I think that he realized that book so beautifully in that, that film, the textures of it, the Italian scenes, the music, of course, very good acting. Uh, it was really a wonderful, wonderful film. No, he's, he's much regretted. How did he come to even know about your or to take on the project of, of the, the number one ladies detective agency? Uh, well, I sold the film rights uh, some years ago uh, to uh, a company based in Johannesburg in, in South Africa run by Amy Moore, who very much believed in the, this film and this project. Uh, and I think that she drew it to the attention uh, of Antony Mangello or uh, got him to read, the, uh, to read the books. And I think when, when he'd read the books, uh, then, he, uh, then he thought that this might be for him, and so he he worked on it with Richard Curtis, who did uh, four weddings and a funeral, and so I knew it was in very good hands because I don't think that that particular team could uh, could make a bad bad film if they tried. They were so so good. So I, I had great confidence because I knew that Mengele was was actually um, uh, appreciating uh, the ethos of the books and also re respected the country. He w he went and visited the country and uh, tried to get an understanding. Uh, of its uh, its customs and its feel, and it's it's a remarkable country, Botswana. It's a it's a very admirable country, and um, Anthony Mengele picked that up, and uh, he was much appreciated by them because it was very important uh, for the people of Botswana because this was the first time their country was being shown In on film light. to a world audience. So a great deal was at stake uh, for them. And I, I think it's a wonderful thing that um, uh, Anthony Mengele and HBO and the BBC did in um, uh, going along with the positive interpretation uh, of the country that I had in the books. A and you're meant. considered the, the patron saint uh, of Botswana. No, no, I'm not. Well. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> you may certainly not know not, that, no. but uh, no, no, certainly you've, not, you've no. put, it, put it on the map for, for many Americans who, who have only <laughs> seen Africa portrayed as a, as a tragic continent and, and not this wonderful, spiritual, alive place like Botswana that we see in your series. Well, well th 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 that's very interesting. Thank you for that, because I, I think that I it is a great pity that the portrayal of sub-Saharan Africa uh, it tends to be so negative. Now you can understand the reasons why there's a lot of negative reporting because there are a lot of negative things happening and obviously the media has to report on the harsh face uh, of our times uh, and it does that when it comes to Africa but it tends then not to uh, talk about anything else and so we've become so accustomed to seeing the bad news from Africa that uh, we, we don't realize that there's a lot of good news as, uh, as well. And uh, I think that's one-sided and, uh, and unfair. I mean, it would be as if one portrayed this country by looking at the problems of a very deprived and violent uh, inner city area. I mean, that's not the whole story. It's part of the story, but it's not the whole story. And so uh, the same thing applies um, in Africa, and that Africa is full of um, uh, resourceful um, people um, leading, leading these really very good lives uh, with great generosity of spirit um, and ingenuity, and uh, I think that's that's a story which de deserves to be told rather than the story of everything that's wrong. You dedicate <coughs> this thirteenth book in in your series, uh, the, the Saturday Big Tent Wedding Party, to Dr. Max Essex, who mm. is with the uh, he's a Harvard law professor, mm. the Harvard uh, uh, AIDS Institute. T tell me a little bit about the work he's doing. Yes, Ma Ma Max, in fact, is, isn't a law professor. He's he's a 
his background is uh, veterinary medicine. He's a scientist. And uh, he's a very great man. Um, the Harvard AIDS Initiative uh, is a wonderful project uh, that um, Harvard University has uh, undertaken um, in, um, in, in Africa, and particularly in Botswana. And Max Essex, who was one of the towering figures in AIDS research, uh, and indeed made some very important early discoveries uh, in relation to HIV way back when it was first being, being studied. Um, he has directed this, this project and made a major difference uh, to the lives of, of, of people. It's no um, longer a death sentence in Botswana. Well, it, it isn't because um, the Bots Botswana ha has always uh, fortunately been able to afford uh, the um, uh, antiretroviral drugs, and, and so the, the, there is money for, for health there because it's got a reasonable income. It's a middle-income uh, income country because of the diamonds. But it's just the, 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 the tremendous work that, uh, that he has done, and indeed uh, the United States uh, has been really good uh, in, in helping uh, with the AIDS um, uh, pandemic. Uh, and in Botswana, the United States has done more than anybody else which is something that I think we need to need to remember. And so I dedicated this book to uh, to Max uh, because uh, I just admire what he's he's done. He's all sorts of in, in, interesting work, and he's he's he of course is one of the people working on a on a possible vaccine. So uh, more power to his um, elbow, and he's much appreciated in in Botswana. They're very very much uh, appreciative of, of what what he and. Uh, and, and Harvard and indeed the United States have done. Alexander McCall mm -hmm. Smith, thank you for being good company in person and in print. Thanks Th so much for talking with us. Thank you very much indeed. I've enjoyed that. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Alexander McCall Smith. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll also find an excerpt from McCall Smith's latest book, The Saturday Big Tent Wedding Party. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next conversation from Penn State. If you would like to purchase a DVD of this or any episode of Conversations from Penn State, order online at mediasales.psu.edu or call 1-800-770-2111. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you. This has been a production of WPSU.